Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Next, field trip presentation. High school Europe. Ms. Roberts. Hello. Um, I am here on behalf of the So I know that you guys have already looked at the proposal for this trip. The big thing is uh, there's been very little interest from the class of 2020, and the class of 2022 has expressed a lot of interest. So we would like to just open it up to all of those current freshmen. Um, because if they want to take advantage of the trip, we think that would be a good opportunity for them. So kind of a big focus with that trip. Any this, questions about that? This is the trip in April 2020? Yep, 2020. Yep, to uh, Ireland, Wales, and England. Yep. Any questions about the trip in general? No, oh, I think you're right, everybody. There was some, I'm just looking for it. It says here that students, sophomores have been involved before. Yes, they have. I know um, one just went on the current trip, or last year's trip, and the year before that, or the trip before that, sorry, I forget, it's not every year, uh, there were a few sophomores who went. And Ms. Camuso feels confident that they're usually mature enough, um, and most of the kids who have expressed interest that I had last year were really mature and seemed to be interested in that they would be kind of like self-sufficient, and the student group wouldn't have to worry about. Um, I really think that that class is a good class. So there shouldn't be issues with the, the younger age. Um, I think most of them are prepared to go. Obviously, we have chaperones and we have the tour guide with us, so we're not kind of letting them loose, which is probably the biggest concern. Any questions? We should just, it just seems like a smaller, yeah. more yeah. contained group as it is. So yeah. We yeah. have uh, sophomores, juniors, juniors and seniors. Mm -hmm. Glad that you can expand it to try to get every slot filled that you need filled too. Yeah, absolutely, and it seems like the, some of the friendship groups, mm -hmm. it would also be great for that. Um, some of the kids who express interest from the current class of 2021 have friends in the class of 2022, so I think it would be a great opportunity. It's always more fun to go with your buddies and friends, so I think it would be beneficial for all of them. Is this every other year? Every two it years? depends. Um, Sometimes it's every year, and mostly it's every other year, depending on the student interest. So motion to amend the approval to include sophomores. Second. All in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and you're next. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I have to sit and stand again. <laughs> <laughs> might not get back up. <laughs> um, so the New York trip, I know this is the third year in a row we've run it. Uh, it's for the eighth grade to New York City, to the Natural History Museum, Medieval Times, Ellis Island, Statue of Liberty, and of course the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. Uh, it's a two-day trip. We'd be going May 9th and 10th, so Thursday, Friday, which is fantastic because, like Ms. Adam was saying, we had that weekend to recuperate. Because in the past, when we used to do this as a Boston trip, and it was like Wednesday and Thursday, we know the students weren't coming in. So the time is perfect. It's in between MCAT days. We already checked it out. So we'll actually be gone when seventh grade are testing, which is kind of convenient for them, a little quiet. Um, and we also think that it'll be a nice break in between some of the MCAS testing. You know, nice out, the weather should be perfect. Um, it shouldn't affect too many children with schedules for sports. Um, but of course, if that happens, we make arrangements with the coaches and things like that. Um, do you guys have any questions about the itinerary? I know I didn't send the itinerary. If you guys want a copy of it, I can send you a copy of exactly I can break down the time and things like that. It's the same itinerary that we've run in the past. So that, that was my question. Yeah. Yes, it's the same. Yeah. Yeah, same. It, it was running really smoothly. The first year we had a few kinks to figure out. Last year it ran really, really well, even though it was very hot out. Um, so I think everything is really down pat. So it's a perfect itinerary. It's not too much but also not too much downtime. So when we get back from medieval times, we're usually pretty tired and in bed. Um, it's not too early to get up. A little bit earlier than usual, but it seems to really work. And the, um, the itinerary, I think the kids are really interested because it's a lot of fun stuff, but educational, but again, not too much for two days for eighth grade because it can be a lot for that age. No musicals? No, I will say as much as that would be phenomenal, that adds a lot to the cost of the trip. Um, which is really unfortunate. We have looked at that in the past. I think that alone added at least hundred dollars. So just for the two-day trip, we're trying to keep the costs low. If you took them to Hamilton, they would add a thousand. Uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to help you guys to Hamilton. I can't even get tickets for the tour. <laughs> um, 
we do have some fundraisers in mind. We have the popcorn fundraiser that we always do, the November setup, which goes directly to each student. And then we're probably going to do two like overall fundraisers that go to the total cost of the trip, which will be a dine-in and then most likely a car wash in April. I think it's nice round. That one's a really low cost, you know, kind of easy fundraiser to do. So that's the plan. Uh, we're always looking for more fundraisers if the eighth graders and the class officers really want to do more. We're all on board for that supportive. So we have three planned for right now, possibly more. Questions about the cost or the itinerary? Just really, really enjoyed it. Yes. I think, I think you all went on this one too. I don't. I think there is a new trip because that's where we're going to switch over between Austin and New York. Yes. So they don't get to do it overnight. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to clarify: the pricing is really based on the rooming situation. Mm -hmm. So we um, we generally price it out initially for the high cost. So we would do. We wouldn't do 49, we'd do 389, um, but that is without fundraising and without the trustees' money, which they're usually really generous, thankfully. Um, with their donation, it should not cost fifty-four dollars per person, and that's if every student goes, which often unfortunately isn't the case. There's always a few. So it should bring the cost down to about three thirty for fundraising. Is what we're looking at, hopefully. Sounds like you guys have worked out the itinerary and timing and any yeah. challenges you may have encountered in prior years with yeah. traffic and transportation and yeah. stuff like and that. The shuffling of groups yeah. and the uh, chaplains and stuff like that. So yeah. it's definitely running very smoothly. Great. We already have a parent interested in being a chaperone nurse, which is great. Oh, excellent. Yes. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> 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 so, okay. So. And another. All right. Any other questions? Question to approve the eighth grade New York City trip. Second. All favor. Thank you. 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 Okay. And now, let's see. Now we have the health presentation. It's done to you. I'm just going to have a seat. Sure. Um, so, for those of you that um, have been to my presentation before, you'll know that I'd like to send you a live data in advance so that the presentation itself is not so dry, and it gives you an opportunity to take a look at some of the um, statistics and the things, um, issues, the health issues that we're dealing with in health services, and um, come prepared with any questions if you have them. And then I would like to take this time for a little bit of a more relaxed presentation and just highlight a few things that I think are interesting fun and um, have a little time for a discussion. Um, so I think I'll start with some of the highlights. I think all of you are probably parents of students in school, so you know about the birthday celebration plan that came out of the wellness community. And um, if you're not, if you don't completely understand it, the concept is that we are um, discouraging any outside food from coming in for birthday parties and, and discouraging birthday, individual birthday celebrations and instead having once a month, which will, for this month I think it will be this Friday, um, that we will um, be system say the names of all the students who are celebrating their birthday and then everyone in the school will have a treat um, in the cafeteria that day. And uh, Diane has even arranged that some of the treats will be gluten-free and dairy-free, so that there's, she's hoping to deal with all the dietary restrictions and all the students, so everyone will have something that is nutritional, but still has a treat. And um, in doing this, we think that we, we know that there's going to be more classroom time for learning. Um, and uh, less pressure on parents. We've heard a lot from parents about um, how much peer pressure there is to have a better party than somebody else had, or to at least have what someone else had. And we know that that's very time consuming and can be expensive for parents. Um, it gives us a chance to treat all the students equally, and um, it's also terrific in terms of meeting the regulations that are mandated um, for 
concentration of our kids in terms of what gets served in the school. Um, and we also think, besides of being more nutritious for the students, it also sets a good example. So I will say that this plan was uh, six years in the making. <laughs> so it may have just seemed like a letter that came in the mail, but it has been a lengthy discussion and a lot of research. And um, we're really grateful to finally be able to implement it. And we hope that it's well received. Um, I thought I would tell you about one program at each one of the schools. Um, this report is actually for the 2007 to 8 school year, so it's from last year. And um, at the elementary school, we had one student um, who had required one-on-one -on -one care since coming to school um, in kindergarten. Um, the student suffered from a very severe form of a um, chronic health condition that made the student very fragile and medically unstable. The family had submitted letters from <coughs> their physician that said that um, if the student didn't, wasn't accompanied by an adult at all time who was focusing on the student, that it could be life threatening. So um, since the student had been at the school, we had had um, full up here, um, or sometimes two parents splitting the full time job. Um, as that student age, we recognize not only their increased ability, but also how important it would be socially and developmentally to have them be independent before they came home to have kids. I think it would be, uh, we recognize it would be a tremendous burden on the student to have to have someone with them at all time um, when they're becoming teenagers and very socially conscious. So um, Kirsten, who's our nurse over at the elementary school, started working, uh, collaborating very closely with the parents, um, the health care providers, the teachers, um, the principal, and um, we developed a plan that uh, went over a two-year period of time to have the student become increasingly independent. And it was an extremely time-consuming process in order to collaborate well and to have the changes happening that were happening in school mirrored at home so the student would feel comfortable and understand what the expectations were. Um, and by the end of last year, we were able to no longer have a parent. This year, the student is at Hopkins, and um, when the student's condition is stable, the student is only going to the nurse house again. So for us, this is a huge success. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that happened at Hopkins last year is we certainly are aware, as I'm sure you are, that they being educated. So the nurse, and one of the counseling staff um, went outside the district and got trained and learned a lot more about vaping and then came back and we designed some vaping uh, presentations for all of the faculty and faculty meeting and made sure that the vaping issue was getting included in the curriculum. And uh, Michael Mono um, was one of the people in the office of the In terms of a mental health language, those of you that have been on the campaign before, uh, we have had a mental health plan for several years. Um, <coughs> this year will be the last year to be phased out. Um, but last year when I came uh, before the committee and talked to you about the protocols that we had developed for suicide prevention, that was just one aspect of the mental health plan protocols had been accepted and um, everyone in the district had been trained in suicide prevention and postage. Um, at that time the committee was um, 
very adamant that he wanted to see me do more outreach into the community for educating families. So with your encouragement, that's when I started the column that appeared in the Annex Weekly email update about resilience. Um, <coughs> resilience being an important attribute for suicide prevention. Um, we didn't, I didn't call it suicide. Um, I think that when we talk about suicide, people are very sensitive and hesitant to talk about it, but resilience is something that everyone's comfortable with and that um, sounds strong and positive. And I will say that um, I've had a lot of positive feedback this year about how good the column was last year. So, Last year, I just kept writing it. I wasn't sure what was happening. And now I find that there's people who actually get it. So <laughs> I'm feeling very pleased about that and, and very positive. Um, so with this being the, so now I thought I will talk a little bit about um, some of the ideas I have for this year. Um, in continuing the mental health career, this will be the year when we incorporate the suicide prevention curriculum into the classroom, and we're going to start with the ninth graders. Um, unfortunately, we lost our teacher who was um, trained to do that, so I'm developing an educational curriculum for um, Karen South, who is going to be teaching how the curriculum this year. And um, we have all the materials ready for the students. As soon as she feels comfortable, can fit it into her curriculum. And um, as a parallel to that, immediately following the presentation of the curriculum, there is a suicide screening to assess each one of the students um, for risk and um, to make sure that we do an immediate action or a follow-up for individual students. Um, I'm also concerned, as um, most people are, about the opioid crisis. And one of the thoughts that I had was, I'm not sure that I want to call it opioid, but continue to do a column um, in addition to Anna's emails and make it on a poisoning prevention. Because opioids, um, it is a form of poisoning anytime there's an overdose. And I think that um, in doing poisoning, I can also address some of the other issues that were uh, facing across the country in um, medication being accessible to young people, medication that's been uh, a wrong incorrectly prescribed for older people, and it, it opens up a whole wide area of health education. And I thought I would not take that much. Um, it also, uh, poisoning is a I don't have the numbers available at the moment, but it's a very high percentage of young people's deaths come from this. Um, I was also thinking about the possibility of using the website. I've been waiting for that for a long time. We've been hearing about it for years, and now we have it. So I think that that's going to be a good place where we can put some educational information, some of the information about resiliency that we've de developed over the years some of our information about um, gender equity um, and LGBTQ issues, um, and just to use it as a, a great place to put information on for the access and the improvements. Um, we're thinking about um, doing some education of the teachers at the elementary school on when it's appropriate to send students to the health office. Um, the visits at the elementary school, the numbers of encounters continue to be pretty high, and that's a concern to us. And, um, and we are tracking as we do every single encounter, and we are seeing a lot of students who could have been out in the classroom, like a loose tooth, unless it's really bleeding heavily. We can teach the teachers how to take care of that. And so, we want to make sure that we do get the students that need to come to us and uh, that we don't disrupt the classroom unnecessarily. Um, and then there was just one 
concern that I wanted to bring up to you this year. If you took a look at the documents that I sent you, you may have noticed that I did um, a survey of- It's six o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you bring up? Okay. I guess you should prompt all of us. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> so, um, school nurse substitute compensation. Um, we are having, we have in recent years had increasing difficulty uh, uh, recruiting and retaining substitute school nurses. Um, and what we hear from ourselves is that they can make more money working somewhere else nearby so that they're going to pass on our offer and work somewhere else. Um, and one hand, I do want to say that we are very aware of the budget constraints in the district. Uh, we realize some of the implications of, of the uh, financial shortfalls, and that concerns us also. But I know that if I'm unable to keep subs and we have to bring somebody in, and I do it um, from an agency, the hourly charge is 52 to 50. So I want to make sure that you understand both what I'm facing. Um, I only have a couple of subs. They all have very limited amount of time. And um, every sub that we have is working for other subs. So if you have an opportunity to take a look, I'm not expecting any answers immediately. And related to that is um, substitute nurses for field trips. So this is very timely that the field trip coordinator should be here. Um, if the school nurse determines that a nurse has to attend the trip in order to protect the health of a student or some of the students, um, then we have to line up a substitute trip. Um, the way that our attorney has interpreted contract that says. Um, Fred has said that field trips are paid in the same amount for a 24 hour period as they are paid for a seven hour day. So I'm having a hard time getting subs for $125 for a seven hour day. And then we are asking them to go on a field trip and make that same amount of money but to be on call for the entire period. And uh, this has proven to not be very attractive. So, can you remind us which unit um, contract this is about? Because I, I remember these discussions. It's not. I'm sorry, Mercy Sarah. Yeah, it's not. It's, uh, substitutes are not covered under the collective bargaining agreement, not members. They're not employees of the district, they're not members. So, including field trips. Uh, including field trips, yeah. including, yeah, this, a substitute teachers is not covered, just as substitute teachers are not covered. Got it. So you were saying so Fred's inter way. legal interpretation of uh, well, the contract. Well, I had told you that he had consulted with Fred. That was his, that was what I heard back. He said the subs would get the same amount for a 24 hour period when you were your recollection? That is absolutely correct. They're not paid more than two. That's me show up. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> they're not paid. Uh, they're not paid any more than the per diem rate, but they don't have bargaining rights under the contract. They're not covered under the agreement. So, uh, what we've done for field trips is we have worked very hard to recruit parents who are uh, foreigners, and we have been successful in here. <laughs>
Um, so one, so I understand $125 is the entire day's worth for 24 hours when I can pay more. As far as housing and just the cost of the trip itself, mm -hmm. where does that get from? So my understanding is that um, if a nurse is going to go on a field trip, in order for them to be covered under the school's liability insurance, they need to be have some, even if it's a parent going on, there needs to be some compensation right. for them. And that has been negotiated between the field trip coordinator and the nurse who's going. And so, so they would not incur any expenses for that trip because oh, they essentially are an additional chaperone, just like the other chaperones aren't incurring expenses, they're not incurring expenses. And how often are we doing that versus having parents who also happen to be nurses? So if there's a parent who happens to be a nurse and they're willing to do that, many parents are grateful for that because that ultimately drives down the cost of the field trip for everybody, so they're happy to. Um, I would say just about every time there's a licensed nurse, there's a parent who's available and who's stepped up for the elementary school. So it's, it's, I can't tell you. Sure. What yeah, I'm just curious. And then the liability or the legal concerns around having a parent that's a nurse. I mean, oh. so it's okay because one, they're licensed, uh, and two, they essentially, um, as Renee just pointed out, Attorney Dupre has indicated that providing them, whether it's a per diem compensation or in kind compensation by hotel, admission to the park, whatever it is, that they're they're considered. Uh, Coming I mean, the same as way as, way as any teacher shopper or any other adult shopper on the trip. Okay. And I've um, insisted that they go through exactly the same process as any person who we want to hire. So they yeah. have their interview, I right, check a few references, I verify their license. Um, uh, we make sure that they have their orientation and training. We make sure that they have CPR. Um, 
I, I would just like to express concern over that, I'm not really knowing exactly what that list would be. Um, also knowing different comfortability levels of different teachers. I know some would go for it and some would automatically send the kid to the principal or to the nurse's office anyway. Um, and then in terms of, I know technically you're supposed to be like, oh, you're supposed to be a licensed nurse to administer medication. But I know there's a lot of business in nurse because of medication. And I know some teachers that have decided upon themselves to give the child to get medication, get the child medication off times, or get the child to the nurse and get the medication off times. So um, I would just hazard you to consider, to, to, consider, to take some other things into consideration when talking about training the teacher. Did you say that you know that teachers are giving students medication? I know, I, I know of an occasion where a teacher administered medication um, and it was out and it was off time. Off time meaning? A half an hour early. Oh, I was not aware of any teachers that were giving students medication unless we had trained them to do so on a field trip. Would you be comfortable at I'll speak with you after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'll get in touch with you. Okay. And, and our thinking in teaching and talking to the teachers about when it's appropriate to send students to the health office is also to make sure that the students do come to the health office when they need to. So um, I, I appreciate your comments. So that's disturbing to me. Well, along the lines of what Keith was saying, I think you, you, you know, you kind of walk the fine line of um, kind of the common things that you might be able to tell the teacher to look for versus making them feel like they're trying to diagnose something. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I'm um, hearing you want to avoid. But you, know, you also don't want the student to feel like they they shouldn't be going to the nurse. Right. You know, so I you know I, I'm sure it's going to be tough to try to come up with those criteria, but even just starting with some of the simple things like you said that you know a loose tooth versus something that might be more severe that maybe that's a starting point. Well, we recognize that some of the kids, if they're losing a tooth, want to come to the tooth office because we're the ones that have the tooth necklaces. Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if we were willing to make tooth necklaces available in the classrooms, there's a possibility that they could take out their tooth, get their tooth necklace, and go right back to them. I don't want to sound like I'm not funny, but I don't really want a tooth necklace in my office. Just, <laughs> just <saying. laughs> I know there have been days that for my kids, the nurse's office has been a real like respite to some of the chaos that can happen in the class or in the child's mind. So um, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not a medical emergency that needs to be, you know, a doctor or a nurse. But um, having that open door, I think, is helpful. I think that shows us some of the numbers too when you look at the numbers of anxiety in years past versus now too that children behaviorally these days just need more support. It's more stressful in general. So yeah, I agree. It's, a, it's um, challenging for us because uh, one of the things that's challenging is that we have a psychologist and we have the at, at elementary school, but I don't believe that we have an adjustment counselor. Um, oftentimes, the students that um, are not actually having physical symptoms, um, but wanting a break or quiet or comfort or something to talk to, will end up in the health office. I just want to say two things, too. Um, so, I, I, I agree with you guys about the word of poison at first I was thinking well I guess it, it's all your background and what you've known and experienced so knowing that poison is more than what you're right and, and a person who may not look at it from that higher perspective um, but recognizing that and I think opioid epidemic is huge vaping is huge but recognizing that it's gone even far beyond that to common household substances and toxicities that are within the home that are not accidental and being used on purposes for challenges or whatnot. And trying to tap into that and kind of mix that into sometimes just as large of a concern for 
younger children who don't really understand. Um, and then I should probably know this, and I and I don't. I looked at the at the school website. Do you have a, a a noticeable health tab, or you know, a nursing tab, or is there something on there that clearly indicates a section for nursing or? There's a section for nursing. Oh, and it's visible on the main page. I'm just wondering, like, I is it? To look. Tara, I feel like it is, but I can't see it in my head. I can't so, <laughs> I should know. I was going to say, I should know. know. The new website structure, but I did check when we first set it up to make sure that it was there. So we um, will take a look at the yeah, website we tomorrow will. and yeah. see who we yeah. yeah. Oh, so, look, look at that. Is it a good idea? idea. Under the family resources, there's a section. Because yeah. I do think that we would have that section and Annie's um, weekly email has been important because I think that's such a good way to get the information out because everybody does read her mm -hmm. weekly email. So it's really great to have it in there because you don't get missed. And so I just, I think it's great to have it there or having, you know, a blurb at the end saying, for more information, go to the school's website, look here, something that guides them for more information and that it's clear that they know where to find it on our website so that your tab doesn't go unnoticed with that information. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Just one last comment. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll make it quick, I promise. Um, I was at the uh, CES, Collective Approach for Personal Services um, board meeting on the Saturday six months ago, where uh, they did a whole presentation on SPIFI and SPIFI data. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, members of the board, who are all representing different school committees, who were saying, is there a reason why our superintendent or school would not be presenting this on an annual basis at our school committee meetings? And I thought to myself, there should be no reason whatsoever. And thank goodness that we look at these issues directly and try to address them each year. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. And, and the reason that we're not looking at that spiffy data is that uh, it's a every two years. So last year, which is what I'm reporting on, was not even two years. It just and wasn't a spiffy year. It wasn't a spiffy year, but it's true. But whenever it is, you do bring it to us. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I do appreciate the opportunity to present. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. We are on to topic E: Superintendent update, opening the school. All right. Field trips. All right. We did. Okay. okay. So. Great, and we have some teachers here that I can thank. Will I draw your attention to the numbers that I'm really thrilled about? Last year, 922, 2017, our total uh, school choice in totals for Cadley Elementary and Hopkins Academy were 79, and as of 920 uh, last week, they were 98. So we're about 19. And I think it's a combination of things, but I certainly appreciate all the work that Unit A members, Unit A will be teachers, and uh, our ESPs and others, that all of our faculty and staff have done to try to brainstorm. They brought ideas before you, we put ads in the paper, they've looked at um, doing certain kinds of certifications and endorsements. Ms. Lanham is uh, interested in looking a little bit at how we can flesh out that global study certificate. So I want to thank uh, Students don't attend a district, they attend a school. And the quality of the school is dependent upon the educators in it, so thank you. And what else can I tell you? So more students are coming, and our diversity, we have increased diversity, and that's great news also. So, um, it, and it, it feels to me, although I should look at that data more closely from year to year, this is only this year's data, it does feel to me, diversity across the district, and I feel like there's a lot of diversity in Hopkins be just feeling subjective, but it does feel like the students and new students who have arrived at Hopkins come from all over the world, literally, and that's been wonderful. I've included for you tallies by grade, um, so we're off to a good start. I will have uh, more school choice information for you after our October 1 count, and I can give you information on school choice out, but we won't have that until those numbers are certified. So a great start.
again, I thank the teachers and staff for making that possible. It's great to do that. I'll just compliment everybody on open house. I had a great time following my kids' schedule, so that was fun. <laughs> I, did too. I was pretty confused by the schedule. <laughs> I was wandering <laughs> around. <laughs> oh, the and the dog and moons look great. Oh, but the yeah, I did. <laughs> I have to comment on that. My, my youngster came home and told me what a nice um, classroom environment he has mm -hmm. with special lighting and carpeting and just. It, provides an atmosphere of creativity mm -hmm. uh, that the kids really notice. So, yeah. Thank Thank you. Really yeah. Wonderful. And our senior Sophie Burrard did a wonderful job. Her remarks I included them in the email last week. She wrote a great job. She's a great kid. Great. Thank you. Okay, schedule of presentations. So that is just a suggested annual schedule for you yeah. all. We can add things. Um, this is typically, these are the uh, kinds of things that we look at every single year. Uh, so uh, for example, the nurse leader health office data happened this month, but you'll see school and district strategies next month, a district PD plan after I've met with interested members of the PD committee, uh, my goals, and you'll get MCAS and accountability data next month. MCAS data will be off embargo at midnight at 12.01 a.m. on Thursday morning for all of you who want to race to the website and see it. And so I could not present it to you tonight. There will be people to do. I would have been one of those people. So. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, they get it too early. Um, so I'll give it to you next month. Um, but if there are any other, um, if, there, if there's any other data that you'd like to see throughout the year, and there's a logical time to look at it, you can just let me know. We do have twice, and I'll ask um, advisors of student clubs who are interested in bringing what they're working on in front of the school committee. Um, I do have that in there as well, so you can hear from different student groups. Great. Okay. Okay. I think you need just a few more acronyms. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do have a lot. We get dimples. We don't have dimples. We don't do dimples. <laughs> Replace dimples or spiffy. All right, request for waiver building use. Yeah, so FDC Robotics is not a um, it's not a school club, but many of our students participate in it. Uh, Bob Cullen is the one who is kind of the advisor. So this is a private club, and I uh, first I forget what it stands for. Shoot, first tech challenge. First tech challenge. Thank you. Um, and so they have massive needs that people from all across the state participate in and Bob thought it would be great on um, kind of press or Western Mass and for our school to have it here. So he's requesting, as you can see, they have a certificate of insurance, they have liability insurance, FTC, but he's requesting a waiver of the building use fees, which you have done in the past for nonprofit groups. And if you think that the group is something that um, could possibly benefit the school. So. You can certainly do that if you'd like. And he's presenting that to you as a request. It's very important to support this group. They've done a lot of great things for the students in the community, and I think it would bring great visibility to it. Definitely agree on the visibility. I've attended these meets uh, over the weekends all day long at other schools, and uh, our role, the kids' role, the team's role in hosting it would be. Um, a leadership role for them, mm -hmm. which they haven't yet experienced, but it also gives a chance to showcase our, our school, our kids, our facility, and the, thing, the things that we have to offer. I would agree with all of that, even having never been part of any of that. Um, but I'm just curious, like, what, what are, what would be the normal fee? Like, what? Uh, let me look. I believe that we included. Yes. 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 So, so would they be it's the cost of a six is the cost of a custodian? So any any cost youth related nonprofit. Yeah. They would be youth related nonprofit, um, civic groups. Yeah. So so we don't normally so custodial contracted rates, but what we're we're also saying oh this says this here, so they wouldn't necessarily um, pay anything they're willing to pay um, 
they're willing to pay any fees that are normally incurred. If we already have a custodian on, so for example, they do it on Saturday, on Friday night, we have a custodian on, we won't charge them for things that we would normally be paying for. Um, so if there were any charges associated with it, um, he's asking, and I do believe that they are a nonprofit. If they weren't a nonprofit, then it would be the $25 an hour. When he met with me, um, that wasn't clear to me. So if they were, if, if they don't have a 501c3, then it would be the $25 per hour. And if that's the case, then. No, but, but for Shabbatics is a nonprofit, a very large yeah. national nonprofit. Yeah. And this is affiliated with them, and they are providing insurance. So I think they qualify. As an, so you're really not waiting anything yeah. per se. Sorry for the question I hadn't answered. It's hard to find everything. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. I read it earlier. <laughs> I also don't know, I mean, when I've attended these meets elsewhere, because they're here all day, they often, um, other facilities will set up places to buy food or you can pre-order food. Mm -hmm. so it turns into something that actually can bring in some mm -hmm. income mm -hmm. uh, to the facility in terms of, you know, you've got a captive audience there mm -hmm. uh, because they, the lunch is very structured in one hour. People don't usually necessarily leave. So the boosters set up. Yeah. They've had boosters, they've had cafeterias open where they've had a limited menu and it, they basically take orders ahead of time and ask each mm -hmm. team to turn them in so that they know how much food to prepare and they know what they're going to bring in. Mm -hmm. um, which brings then everybody together in their common area and the teams can visit with one another, which mm -hmm. is also fun. Yeah, yeah. Curiously, um, could that or snacks or something like that um, be used as a fundraiser for any of y'all's trips? <laughs> a fundraiser, it could, I'm sure that Chris was thinking it could bring her lunch account closer. <laughs> 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 he was trying to get the lunch account out of the red, I'm sure, but. <laughs> So it could be, it could be, I think it made those numbers up. So it could be, it could be any of those things. Yeah, and even, and if it were something that the cafeteria that actually wanted to do, then they would have to agree to it. But Mr. Collin did say that, Mr. Collin did say that. And I've seen other places where they've had tables set up for their student groups saying, we're raising money for a trip or for a whatever event, and people coming in from out of town have donated. So. Again, you're bringing in a, a big audience to be able to help contribute to other. A big, how many are we talking about? Oh, I don't know. He, he said a couple hundred. But yeah. I don't know how many schools they were talking about, but yeah. yeah. I believe he said at least 200. Yeah. So do I need to approve that? You do, because in case there are any charges that may be associated, just make me feel good if we had a, if you said no. They, it's okay, we can waive the building use fee. Motion to approve the waiving of the building use fee for a type of receiver by Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. That would be really exciting to think about some of those. I think it's really cool. Okay, I'm that, sorry to pass this because I wasn't here. Did you vote to approve field trips? Yes. We did. We approved all of them, yes. We did. I know I took some forgot to too, because we need two minutes for <laughs> next time. Yep. Okay, uh, personnel report. I think that ends all the presentations and discussion items. Yes. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to stay, everyone. This is great. All right, yeah, I'm back. Thank you. Just going to do it while grabbing it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, personnel report. There is surprise number one. We did have two uh, new ESPs, the educational support professionals we hired. We do have one vacancy right now in Hopkins and Cafe. Public comment. <clears throat> Public just left. <laughs> yeah, the soccer team just came back. And they're in the, uh, yeah, they'll be right like here. All right, uh, business manager report. Okay. Um, as far as the regular expense report, there's really not much to report. You know, it's, it's one of those items of, uh, well, we've got three weeks of school. Um, how much is there to talk about, I guess. But um, basically, everything is, uh, is pretty much going according to plan. There are some accounts 
that are in the negative when you factor in both expenses we've had and encumbrances. I'm thinking specifically of items like the out of district tuition accounts, but those are, it's a temporary in the negative because we have grant money that has not been approved, but you know, of course we're confident it will be, and school choice money that's going to be used to offset some of it. Nothing's been transferred to those accounts yet, so it's, it's negative because we put everything to the local budget, but we have enough to cover them um, in other accounts. Uh, so basically, once we get rolling with a few more expenses, we'll just transfer those into the grant, into school choice, and um, then you see those negatives come right back up. So uh, looking pretty good, really, as, as far as we go so far this year. Um, no, no worries that I can see. The main thing I really wanted to, uh, to talk about tonight was the return of the lunch account to positive status. <laughs> we are at almost $120. I don't want you to pitch <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, with some of these accounts, again, the revenues have not been posted for, um, for August. So we'll actually have, you know, these accounts all go up a little bit. Um, with the exception of school choice, that one has been. So, and the other factor is that so far, at least as of August 31st, the balances from last year were not rolled over yet by the town account. So, when those do, there might be some slight adjustments to this. I hope not as much as $120, because that would really just break my heart at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, um, you know, these are your revolving accounts. We don't have a grant report this month because um, some, grant, some grants were just approved, uh, some we are waiting approval on. There's been no expenses charged to anything yet, so and until they're all approved, and then I think at least it will be uh, in balance of them. And Chris, back on the budget sheets, the summary for tuition to non public schools. Yeah. Is that what you mentioned? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I, I just don't have a page. Yeah, to which we apply. Six eight. Eight. Page six of eight, we apply a considerable amount of grant. One grant is almost entirely uh, we expense out of district tuition. So one hundred and thirty thousand dollars from the two forty grant um, that you know is not in there. I believe one twenty five from school choice, mm -hmm. and I think there's something else as well. I just don't have it off the top of my head, but that, like I said, pretty much wipes out what looks like a very uh, yes. Thank you. There it is. Uh, it looks like a pretty scary amount, but actually, like I said, it will disappear. Okay. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Capital plan as well. Thank you. Uh, I did. I was just at the capital committee meeting. I presented the two items um, along with detailed explanations on the cafeteria equipment. Um, basically filling them in on the uh, freezer with the uh, floor that's pretty much gone at this point in time. Uh, the reasons why we're replacing the cooler as well at the same time, the hood repairs, um, and the serving line uh, that they want to replace. And with the health and security upgrades, I did bump that up slightly, um, just based on something that I found today that I thought should be upgraded as well. It was something while I was in one of the schools that was pointed out to me. Uh, so I mentioned it to them. I did not give any details um, just because I felt that an open meeting that's just not something we wanted to talk about. Uh, but, you know, that's that's basically where we left it. They were trying to figure out what we can do to, uh, to get these on here. Um, I also mentioned we had a um, an inspection by the building inspector at the elementary school. He had a number of items that we needed to address. <coughs> Excuse me. One of them was the uh, wood chips at the playground weren't of the required thickness, so we had to put more wood chips there in case the kids fall. One of the items was the uh, were the cracks in the parking lot, sidewalks. There's a lot of cracks that had grass growing through them, um, and he determined that those are a trip hazard. So we got one price so far, we're actually working on getting more. But to repair all of the cracks at the elementary school is, 
$16,510 is what the price was. So I didn't um, didn't know if they could fit that on the fall, if they wanted to defer it until spring. Um, they were leaning towards deferring it until spring. We also did a price for the Hopkins parking lot. That was 11460 I believe. But the Hopkins parking lot is due to be resurfaced to three years from now. Uh, and I just, that was not written up as, as any kind of violation. I told them at this point in time, I think we're better off just not spending the $11,000 and just waiting until we re resurface the whole parking lot. So. Then, did it come up that the talk about revising the parking lot up here across from the church and the, and the building here? It did not, no. In terms of the parking lot or the driveway? Or? There, there was talk about adding more parking spaces there. Oh, okay. Uh, it was in the paper a week or so ago, and uh, I thought if you know, that got approved and they were going to tap it into our egress road up to Middle Street, mm -hmm. that we could do one big. Oh, I see. You know, the thing is, because I had this meeting, I asked to be put early on the agenda, and when I was done with my uh, yeah. items, I left to come here. So it's entirely possible they were discussing it as we speak. I just don't know. Okay. Now, a couple of items, and you'll have to forgive me if, I, if you've already said this, but items like the girls' locker room that are on the schedule for next year, should we be going out and, and getting some kind of more meaningful pricing than what we have on here? I mean, is that something that you have determined really needs to be done at that point in time? Well, you have the previous, we had the previous plans from 2009 with um, right. folks here like that, right? Um, yeah. Eric and Jeff that they were here, but they also, we know that the pricing is going to change, and it seems like. We'd like to have a more realistic figure, but in terms of priorities, I think we did agree that we put it in that year three mm -hmm. bucket. My sense is yes, they need to be revised. And so I know, like with the air conditioners, we did general estimates, but we didn't get anything specific to the money. Right. You're just saying go out and get another general estimate. It would be rough. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the last estimate we had. Rough estimate, no, let's see. Oh, I think it's the estimate from... 2009, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 2009. There it is, the estimate from 2009. Yeah. Um, the estimate we had was $400,000. I added 100000 to it because I just thought eight years later, there's no way it needs to be that much more um, to bring us somewhat closer to reality. But, you know, again, I, I think, you know, we could ask for some kind of rough estimate just to at least, you know, get us in the ballpark. Yeah. We'll never really know until we go out to bid. Yeah. It doesn't cost us anything to get a rough estimate. Um, it might actually cost a small amount to have um, somebody like the engineers that did the air conditioning project. You know, they, they pretty much know industry standards for how long a job will take, um, how many how many hours of electrician, how many hours of plumber at this rate, and they could give us you know some kind of a more reasonable price. They were actually pretty good to deal with, I have to say, um, for the air conditioning project. Incredibly helpful. I just don't know air conditioners, so that I don't have to turn it on when it's hot and, uh, <laughs> and to yell at my kids if they leave it on too long. Um, so they were just incredibly helpful in getting that project done. You know, and it is completed with the exception of the cafeteria, so that will be in, I think, in a couple of weeks, actually, right? Mm -hmm. The benefit is to have more realistic numbers, um, yes. firmer numbers, and also perhaps to signal to the other finance entities in our town that we are serious about this yeah. next year project. Yeah. I mean, that's a big dollar amount item, so we certainly want to be as close as possible. That's probably a good idea. Especially if it's coming up in 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know um, I had mentioned this to Annie, but if there's a way to incorporate in that the examination of Drain drainage in the boys' lives. Oh yes, that would be helpful if if the yeah. two are in any way related. Like if you're already remodeling the girls' locker room and you're looking at plumbing and drainage and water pressure and all that, um, the boys' locker room has at least one that we know needs some attention when it is yeah. happening. Yeah, that's a roof drain. Um, 
that apparently, my, my only guess is that the, the drain is just not large enough to take a large amount of water at one time, and so it has to go somewhere. Um, and it chooses the boys' locker room, apparently. <laughs> that could be worse place. And, but, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and, and so, yeah, we can certainly look into that. I got the impression from Jeff that it was not the easiest, cheapest fix in the world to do. You know, it actually was quite involved to uh, fix it. Mm -hmm. But you know, we can certainly look into it again just to find out exactly what we're bringing. Anything else, Chris? Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I know we have athletic fields on the agenda, so I guess we can wait until that. Okay. Yeah, let's move to the school committee reports. Um, policy. Keith and I will anxiously await a meeting date to promise. I know. I just, <laughs> so I'm excited. You guys waiting. So then you're like, finally, it's <laughs> here. A policy meeting. All right. Finance and tri board. I have no update from the last um, meeting here that we met. Yes. Oh. So I participated in a conservation commission meeting a week or two ago. And uh, Berkshire Design, our designers, presented their design fields um, they need conservation commission approval the design has actually been more uh, tricky than they thought just to uh, since it's all in a floodplain it's all about water management and maintaining water retention to meet sort of state codes um, so they're proposing to have a pipe that comes from uh, the northwest side down to the uh, southeast side and draining into the ditch that runs along middle street uh, and the Conservation Commission's questions were about um, maintenance of the ditch, who's going to maintain it, how. They asked us to work with DPW to talk about drain ditch maintenance. I said we could do that. Um, and actually, I just realized I have an email from DPW. They've already reached out to him. I need to respond. Um, and, but prior to that, I said that day, there was a, a, a local landowner who claims that part of our proposed revision, athletic field revisions uh, include some of his land. And that's, uh, so we actually have Berkshire Design working with the surveyor who is investigating that. And as you can imagine, old records in Hadley, it's not crystal clear as far as they know. So as of even today, they were still working on reviewing the past records. It's in the southeast corner by the ditch there where the gentleman's claiming he owns some of the property. It wasn't on the original survey we had um, that we all inherited back in 2010. <laughs> so um, the Conservation Commission cannot uh, adjudicate until they have been resolved. If it, if it turns out that that does include some of this property, we have to revise the plans, which would take a little bit longer and a bit more money with the brochure design. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Chris? No, I don't know if you saw the uh, the surveyor responded with the letter okay. saying that he looked through all the records, he couldn't find anything, right. but he will continue to look. Right. It's going to be a tricky thing. It is just because there's there's nothing clear that says one way or the other. You know, so um, it would be interesting to see what he based his original results on. You know, with with such unclear information and maybe. Just going back to his notes or something, even if he still has them, might make some sense. So I can reach out to him for that as well. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've got a meeting with some potential funders this week. So the idea would be once the Conservation Commission, say we resolve the, the land question, the Conservation Commission approves, um, then uh, we have to continue with funding. And that's something I've actually Berkshire design as they're getting closer to finalizing the design, revisiting the cost estimates. We'll never, we won't know the true cost until we get bids. But uh, are we still in the same ballpark of below to mid 500s for the first phase? Uh, assuming that's true, we're looking at generate 100 to 150 thousand dollars for the first phase. So I'm meeting with some funders this week to talk about that. And there was some question to um, a local landowner has an update on this. I provided an update this week to him uh, about where we're going. And he abuts the southeast corner and the crossway to Middle Street that folks use uh, adjacent to his land. So he's inquired about it. So 
problems I'm trying to keep them updated. Were there any visuals that you wanted to show as part of this meeting? Or no, something? that's for my meeting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just checking. Close your eyes.